As more became known about dinosaurs and their overall anatomy, especially over the past 50 years with the dinosaur renaissance, the view of them scientifically and publicly took on a whole new form, one much more bird-like and active given we also came to finally understand that birds were living theropod dinosaurs, highly derived but dinosaurs nonetheless. This coincided with the change from them being seen as slow witters and simple animals as more evidence of the behavioural capabilities, whether that be through trace fossils, fossil beds of multiple individuals being found together, that's on CT scans of their skulls to reveal their brain structure, showing key similarities between known intelligent animals like their relatives, the crocodilians and birds. Going into more detail, Hoosing behaviour is known well from the study of dinosaur trackways, which show adult care and association of juvenile animals amongst many different dinosaur groups, from theropods, sauropods and ornithopods. Many also nested in groups, with some evidence showing evidence of biparental care, much of which is very reminiscent to the hoosing, parenting and hunting behaviours seen in mammals and birds today, and not so much being characteristic of other reptiles. Comparisons of their brain size relative to their body size has over time reinforced the conclusion from this behavioural data that many dinosaur genera would have rivaled many living animals in their sophistication, especially in theropods like anellosaurids, tyrannosaurids and especially the manoraptorans. A key animal used to showcase dinosaur intelligence is Truodon, a genus that today with a great deal of controversy surrounding its validity, has a brain body size ratio falling within the lower edge of the avian and mammalian ranges quite comfortably, and from there, the question was proposed that if they had managed to survive either the KPG extinction or if it never happened, could they have become just as intelligent as people? This was explored most notably with the dinosaur humanoids of Dave Russell, who interpreted their larger brains, grasping hands and binocular vision of being key adaptations for increased intelligence down the line evolutionarily. While being heavily flawed and rightfully criticised, later walked back by Russell for being too anthropocentric and it being unlikely that an intelligent dinosaur would arise with such a human-like body plan given our very specific evolutionary history, and that the human body plan is neither not predetermined to arise nor the only form that intelligent life can take, it still gave rise to a ton of speculative evolution ideas and discussions which continue to this day. Continuing on, to answer the question of whether dinosaurs could have had the potential to achieve human levels of sapience is of great interest and for a good amount of reasons too. For one, understanding said possibility could help in understanding how similar endpoints could result from different ancestries, similar to how structures like wings can develop in many different anatomical ways, with the starting points of all of the varying structures constraining the eventual outcome. It is also a question of great relevance as to know or not if the evolution of greater intelligence is constrained in some form by the features of brain organisation and structure in the earlier members of a given lineage and if the evolution of the human brain and our cognitive capacity that goes with it was possibly unique events made possible by the features of our organisation, incidentally present in ancestral mammals, but not present in those of dinosaurs. The assumptions of whether or not this was the case or not was brought up in a recent paper in April of this year, authored by Anton Reiner, the current professor of anatomy and neurobiology at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center, who went on to suggest that there were four assumptions to be made in order to evaluate the potential dinosaurs has primarily focusing on the organisational features of their brain. To begin, the encephalization quotient, or EQ, pretty much measures the extent to which a given brain exceeds the required size to operate the motor and sensory functions of a body at a given size, and to what extent the extra brain matter then presumptively relates to higher orders of cognition, perception, and other such tasks. From this, it's seen quite clearly in people, though other researchers have criticised this approach, noting that brain size measured alone can be misleading since neuron density and distribution can vary wildly among species to species for a given brain size, and hence being a more apt predictor of intelligence than the size of the brain alone. Something which underlies the high EQ and our cortical neuron abundance is the expansion of our cerebral cortex, but not just in regards to its total size, but also in the number of the separate units of which it is formed. Known as cortical areas, which are in many but not all cases distinct from one another, are organised in a hierarchical manner, with the closest enabling higher order abstract levels of information processing. This first assumption therefore assumes that a human level of intelligence in dinosaurs will need to require a good number of these cortical areas, one that is comparable to that found in humans. An increase in said distinct cortical areas and functionality, not necessarily including an increase in brain size or neuron abundance, is therefore noted to be a requirement, or at least considered to be necessary for a human level of intelligence. This can be seen quite clearly when comparing us to other related primates, where we have a great number of cortical areas specifically dedicated to language comprehension and production that is apparently lacking in most of our relatives, but also present on a more simple level in great apes, which, like people, have a larger number of cortical association areas compared to their own relatives, though on a less developed level in that regard. 
Knowing the exact number of distinct cortical areas present in us is, however, not the most certain of things. The recent mapping studies have recognised through mRNA analysis that we do possess at least 180 functional distinct cortical areas in a single brain hemisphere, which is quite a bit higher than macaques at 150, marmosets at 100, and prosimians like galagos at around 50, which itself is about twice the number thought to be present in early mammals. From this at least, it may require another lineage to evolve at least over 150 separate areas to come to a level of human intelligence, at least of this metric alone, and irrespective of whether or not field analysis revises the neocortical area upward. This allows for the possibility to evaluate if the brains of dinosaurs had any features already present that could have limited or allowed for this possibility. Continuing this on to the second assumption, it would be assumed that dinosaurs had an avian type of telencephalic, better known as a cerebrum, level of organisation. It is important to note going forward that the organisation of the Pallium birds differs from mammals owing to their divergence around 320 million years ago. The Pallium is especially important, as it is essential in the processes owing to avoidance learning, and whether to go towards or avoiding certain stimuli, as well as for spatial learning and the temporal aspects of learning processes. From comparing between mammals and birds, it's been noted that the mammalian telencephalon is rounded more centrally, with the Pallium mentioned earlier surrounding the basal ganglia, clusters of nerve bodies both dorsally and laterally. In comparison, in birds, the neurons of the pallium are organised into two major territories, being a dorsomedial region called the Wolst, and a more ventrolateral region called the dorsal ventricular ridge. Overall, the pallium in birds consist more so of separate slabs of tissue that are stacked on top of one another, with the multipolar dendrites of given neurons in each slab being confined to each slab, each having their own separate nuclear groups. Given how a lot of this can be seen in non-avian dinosaurs like Truodon, also noting how similar their brains are to living birds, by the lengthened olfactory bulbs used for smell. It is therefore very likely that they, alongside other related theropods, were indeed on an avian level of organisation. The importance of how information is processed by the neurons within the differing layers of the neocortex is a third assumption in how much potential dinosaurs would have had, as the interaction between all of these different neurons is critical to its function. To cut a long story short, the paper goes into more depth regarding this, which you can read for a more in-depth review down in the description. It was found that when comparing between a mouse and a chicken, the former has axonal pathways between the cortical neuron types of less than a millimetre, where on the other hand, the chickens were substantially more than a millimetre, which meant that there would have been inefficiencies because of the additional areas in the avian pallium, which thereby caused the larger axonal length. The fourth and final assumption is based on the knowledge that an increase in axonal length between neurons carrying out processing is harmful in the efficiency of carrying out said processes, owing to the increased delays in transmission caused by the greater distance. It is also worth noting that the proximity of the cortical layer neuron types to others of their kind does not always favour the mammalian cortical layouts over the avian organisation when it comes to measuring intelligence, given many large brains and paleoral neuron rich avian species like crows and parrots show many complex problem solving, memory, and behavioural quirks, which rivals or even exceeds that of many primates and apes, far exceeding many mammals of their size range. Still though, there may well be some more differences when it comes to the cognitive ability between these avian groups and similarly comparable mammals. The paper brings up the mirror test as an example, noting how many animals, including ourselves from young ages, have an awareness of themselves, which while still limited among them, is apparently more widespread than in comparably intelligent avians. Very intelligent birds like common ravens, certain species of crow and African grey parrots, have all generally not shown mirror-guided self-recognition, though with some exceptions being reported in Indian crows and in a group of three out of five Eurasian magpies. This shows that while the proximity of the cortical layers to one another may not definitively favour the mammalian cortical over the avian nuclear paleo organisation, the axon distance issue may well become more constraining as more cortical areas and neurons are added into the latter, which will be further discussed too. From all of this, the study concludes that because of all the four assumptions laid out earlier, that the brains of animals like Trozon or in other dinosaurs would have been more limited in their ability to answer the number of functioning cortical areas needed to reach a human level of intelligence. Said conclusion is based on three lines of argument, the first being the organisation of the paleo organisation in avians compared to the mammalian cortical organisation. Drawing parallels between them is often an uncertain exercise, but regardless of how they are compared, the distances in birds between the mesopallium and its input sources and output targets are a good amount greater than from comparable mammalian counterparts. The previously mentioned chickens had the layer 2 out of 3 neurons surrounding field L2 at about 4.5mm distance from the later 5A-like neurons, which by contrast in mice are less than half a millimetre. 
The avian pattern of the telencephic organisation in these dinosaurs could therefore have indeed proven to be a limiting factor in the ability of any given Manoraptoran descendants to acquire the neural substrate to advance further, due to the information processing inefficiencies that would be introduced with the adding of additional areas to the pallium, causing further increases of the axon length between them. Such increases expected from dinosaur humanoids would therefore predict a greater and greater loss in their processing efficiency, as more and more of the new separate cell populations would be interposed between the separate neuronal populations. Additionally, the need for an increase in axon length to interconnect around the cortical area would itself cause an increase in the volume of the pallium in an avian-style organisation, and further exacerbate the problem of lengthening the axonal connections by being another factor that would cause the axons to be increasingly long. Therefore, Increasing the number of paleo regions in a dinosaur to an equivalent in mammals to up to 190 areas would likely lower the efficiency of the information processing because of how they are distributed in them. Set inefficiency may not have been so insurmountable that it prevented the dinosaurs from reaching avian levels of complexity, nor does it hinder extant birds with their large neuron enriched paleo from showing sophisticated behaviours, but it may well have created a ceiling, whereby the increasing the paleo areas to human levels cannot be achieved, at least going by this. It's also important to note that the cerebral volume needed for a human-level cerebral organisation would be a lot greater with an avian-type level of organisation, as increasing the number of areas requires an additional increase in the axon volume needed to interconnect to other elements. As an example, going from 100 to 200 cortical areas would be needed in a primate of given size to require a doubling of neuronal volume, but not needing a separate increase in the volume of the processes interconnecting layers within a given area. When going from 100 to 200 cortical areas in a primate-like theropod though, there will need to be a doubling of the overall paleo neuronal volume, more than a doubling in the case of the axonal volume interconnecting all of the layers. All of this may have also introduced the problems of metabolic and thermoregulatory supports with an expansion of the brain, and having to accommodate for these changes with blood vessel support leads into another consideration, that being the folding of the gyri and sulci. The cortical areas in mammals are interconnected with each other in a hierarchical fashion within their modality, with this interaction lending to the processing ability of primates and people. Increasing the amount of axon length requirements, however, would certainly be a big problem in the case of adding these new cortical areas, especially since they will need to be interconnected at continually increasing distances. One main way of dealing with this issue comes in the form of being able to reduce the cortex's ability to fold in the previously mentioned gyro and sulci, which greatly reduces the length of the axons required to interconnect them. As a contrast, the non-laminar structure of the dorsal ventricular ridge, or DVR in birds, makes it almost impossible to fold at the surface to the pallium in comparison, though a way in which birds appear to address this issue has been noted. This comes in the way of local sets of cortical areas being highly interconnected, with increased sparse interconnections between small sets of cortical areas. Because of this, the avian pallium does factor in some of the strategies used in the case of the mammalian neocortex to reduce growing axon length, which would have carried over well into any kind of primate-like evolution that they might have undergone. The nuclear configuration of the avian pallium might even be itself an adaptation to reduce the distances between the pallial regions, which with this feature would have helped to reduce the distances for horizontal connectivity in the absence of any folding which along with the small network plan and the high neuron densities noted earlier, may help to explain the sophisticated behaviours seen in corvids and parrots, which could still occur in spite of the issues with axon lengths. The third and final line of argument to consider comes in regard to the consideration of the mapping of 2D space. This includes many different types of sensory space, including visual and somatosensory, the latter involving a network of neurons which helps in our ability and in other animals to recognise objects, understand textures and to generate sensory feedback which can also be used to exchange social cues. These are often mapped out in a 2D layout, with this being ideal for mapping and processing information in the cerebral cortex, which they mainly characterise. This 2D architecture of the mammalian cerebral cortex allowed for finer point-to-point -point transmission, being laterally more efficient at processing information, which is in contrast as to what is seen in the 3D architecture of the nuclear DVR in birds, which may pose problems for their mapping of sensory space and other key neurological points. Examples that possibly show this design constraint include the receptive fields in our visual walls being no smaller than 2 degrees, whereas in mammals it can be as small as 1 degree, as well as the iso-orientation domains in owls also being found to be larger than those seen in cats and monkeys, seeming to show that they need more resources to be dedicated to match comparable mammals. The auditory area in birds has evolved to become a flat sheet within their DVR, which does therefore facilitate the precise creation of such a structure along its extent, and in theory at least, other parts of their DVR could also evolve to be flat sheets to aid in point-to-point -point precision in projections within and between areas. 
For this to occur in all distinct regions in the pallium, however, would mean that other existing areas would need to also be transformed into flat sheets, and that these new areas would need to be inserted along the existing areas to best use the space without requiring more telencephalic volume. Fitting so many of these sheets into a 3D space, like in birds, would require a large degree of tessellation. Covering a plane without any gaps or overlaps which does not seem all that simple to evolve or able to be controlled developmentally. While this hasn't been a critical problem for living birds, this could well be a restriction in achieving higher levels of behavioural complexity in us, though it's still worth looking into more. In conclusion, these lines of reasoning suggest that neither dinosaurs similar to Truodon or others could have gone down the line of a primate-like lineage which could have developed into a human-like intelligence, mainly down to the anatomical reasons as stated earlier. Although the differences mentioned in detail earlier does not necessarily preclude the evolution of comparable cognitive abilities in birds and non-human mammals, what has been brought up does show that differences may or may not be important when it comes to developing to an intelligence level comparable to our own. It's a very speculative line of study, and so assessing the merits of all of these assumptions laid out earlier is a very important line of research, and one the paper has overall lined up quite well. It is worth bringing up that the ideas presented here should not and don't support the outdated notion of mammals being inherently smarter than birds because of their adaptations, rather that lacking such structures like a lemon pallium may have precluded them to be less likely in achieving a human level intelligence if no other alternative exists. The avian pallium can indeed be expanded in regards to its size, neuronal abundance and complexity that allows birds like parrots and crows to be just as, if not more impressive than primates, when it comes to a range of behavioural quirks and tasks so there's clearly quite a lot more to be looked into, some of which we might not even be aware of yet. The discussion of intelligence across animal groups is fraught with debate and controversy, and with so many different factors to consider, I hope I got the point across well in this video, and that as well as what's been presented, there is a lot to consider regarding this field of research, and that more is absolutely needed to further refine our conclusions on how it can come to be, and also what can preclude said developments. All in all, I thank you for watching this video on these animals and that you may have learned something new. If you would like to see more from this channel, be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. And with that, I'll see you next time, whenever that may be.